Hello. Welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of operations. We're going to get down into the operations here and get our hands dirty. We're going to talk about things like manufacturing and production, uh, but it's also important to mind that this, keep in mind that this also applies to things like service, and it also applies to things like inventory control. And historically speaking, a lot of businesses have been organized around the old military model with a, a hierarchy of command. And the reason for that was because at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the military was the only reference point people had for mo uh, mobilizing large groups of people to accomplish a common task. All of the work up till that point had been done by craftspeople. The, uh, the next thing that happened was we brought in the uh, uh, assembly line and mass production techniques and that made the hierarchy almost even more, uh, more ingrained. Then in the late 1900s, we, came up, we started broadening our horizons a little bit, came up with some more progressive thinking about how to organize organizations and how to work production. And we came up with some lean production technology, lean production concepts that we're gonna talk about. And uh, it's, all, it's important to also note that this was uh, my first career. I was, uh, my undergraduate degree is in industrial engineering and my first job was as an industrial engineer in the uh, in a General Motors uh, truck group manufacturing. So this is all very near and dear to my heart. It's fun to sort of come, get a chance to come back and revisit it. But uh, without further ado, let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is some of the basics. We'll just go over some definitions. And I've created here as if we have a process where there's three operations to perform some process. Now it's important to remember this can be production and I'm going to talk about this like manufacturing, but it can also be something like uh, a service where you have a, a cut and oftentimes it's the customer that actually flows through these processes. If you're at the Department of Motor Vehicles, you have to fill, take, a take a paper test and then get your vision checked and then take a driver's test, things like that to get your license. But let's talk about this a little bit in terms of production. The first kind, let's, let's Skip some of these triangles here, that's inventory, we'll get into that in a moment. The first thing I want to talk about is cycle time. And the cycle time is how long it takes to perform a certain operation. And by the way, these can be people or machinery or uh, a combination of both, a workstation with both people and machinery. The, uh, the first one I have here is 10 minutes, the second one is 30 minutes, these arrows show the process flow, and the last one is 20 minutes. And those are the cycle times. Now it's important to note, when this person starts a product, they're going to they're going to do their work and then they're going to pass it off to the next person and then they are going to start on the next one but the problem is this person takes 30 minutes so this person as soon as they work on the second one they're going to get done with it in 10 minutes but they're going to have to wait another 20 minutes until this person is ready to accept it that's what's called being blocked this operator would be blocked because this uh, middle operation takes longer the opposite is what's called being starved so let's say this person finishes their work and they hand it off to the last operator who then ships it in 20 minutes and then they look to this person but this person's 30 minutes so they have to wait 10 minutes until they're done with the next piece that's called being starved this operation is starved and what we notice here is the bottleneck in this operation is the middle uh, the middle operation and that's important for several reasons first of all the bottleneck will determine your capacity how many units per hour can this process create? Well, each operator has theirs. This one is, since it's 10 minutes, that's six per hour. This is 30, so that's two per hour. That's three per hour. But the capacity of the system is only two per hour. It's determined by the bottleneck. The second thing to bear in mind is that the, if you're gonna schedule, you have to schedule around your bottleneck. You also wanna make sure you're always using your bottleneck. Downtime on your bottleneck is bad because every minute lost there is a minute of lost capacity. Whereas a minute here, they have some slack because they might be waiting 10 minutes. So if it goes down for five minutes, it's not so much of a problem. And the last one is if you wanna improve the throughput, how, how many units, what the capacity of the system is, you, you have to add resources and fix the time here at the bottleneck. So if you put two people on there, it might drop that to 15 minutes and then all of a sudden it, the bottleneck moves over here and you're moving things through faster. The, uh, the other thing to bear in mind though is, or if, if it's not necessarily saving you anything to add to decrease these times because they're not determining it, they're not the bottleneck. Um, the next concept I wanna talk about, we talked a little bit about bottleneck capacity, is utilization. This is how much of your resource you're using. It can be any resource. We're gonna talk here about people or machinery. But <clears throat> we are using, uh, because this, uh, first we're gonna use 100% of the bottleneck because we want them up all the time. They're always, because uh, they're, they're 
the, the, the slow one, the first operation is only at 33% uh, utilization because they'll make 10 and then they have to wait 20 minutes and then they work another 10 and wait another 20 minutes. So they're only at 33% utilization. And, also, and then um, the whole system would be at 66% utilization because 100% of this, 33% of that, 66% of that because they're working 20 minutes. Uh, so it's, we're doing two per hour, so they do 40 minutes an hour. So that's, the whole system works at about 66% utilization. Uh, next concept I want to talk about is productivity. This is like a ratio of outputs to inputs. I've also seen that reversed. But for example, you might say that, well, we're, we're making two units per hour. Um, and that's out of three work hours. So that's two units for three work hours or 66%, uh, uh, well, that's, it's, I'm sorry, 0.66 units per hour in terms of productivity. Um, it, because of this example, the way I've defined these things, it, it's just the percentage of utilization. You can also flip that around, like in the auto industry, the productivity is hours per vehicle. So how many work hours does it take? That's actually the uh, input versus output ratio. And the last concept I want to talk about is the start to finish time. We've talked about how we're going to get two of these out per hour, but, that, but if you put one in, it's going to take 10 minutes here, 30 minutes there, 20 minutes there. So it comes, it's going to take a full hour to get one out. Now after that, they'll be coming out every half hour because we're doing two per hour, but the start to finish is one hour. And the last thing I want to talk about here, just under basics, is called line balancing. Because of these things, we've got a bottleneck and sometimes we can move these operations around. Like this, you know, if this is a discrete, they have to do all 30 minutes there, that's one thing, but maybe they're doing several different operations and we can take a little bit of work off them and put it here and maybe some over there and we could get their work down to 20 some odd minutes and that way we could increase the whole system to three per hour. So that's line balancing. You wanna get all the operators working at about the same speed. Uh, because that's the, that'll, that'll improve your measurements here. Your utilization, your, your output will, will increase, your, which will mean your capacity goes up, your utilization and productivity will be higher, etc. Uh, so that's, those are some of the production basics. Now let's talk a little bit about inventory. And when I say inventory, um, this can mean, this also called, uh, I'm gonna cover work in process or items in the queue. I'm gonna use those interchangeably. Some people would say, inventory is finished product, so this is work in process. Let's not get too caught up in the definitions here. But that's what these triangles here were added for. And the importance of the triangle is you'll notice this person is able to work faster than them, so they're having to wait, they're blocked. But if we give them an, an inventory, a queue, where they can put extra work, they can work, they can do, let's say we're gonna have an, uh, a, a one hour day just to keep it simple. So this person's only gonna be able to do two. Well, he can do the, or she can do the first one in 10 minutes, the second one in another 10. Um, the first one goes to the operator, the second one goes in the queue, and then they can either go home if we have that flexible of a labor agreement, or maybe there's something else we can have them do somewhere else in the factory, some other setup work. So, but the point is they're not just sitting there waiting to start working on the next one before they hand it off. So that will increase, so inventory in that instance will actually increase our utilization because we can use that person and, and, and then uh, not pay them for the hours that they're not needed and it will increase our productivity as well. Um, another advantage is uh, in terms of downtime. So far we've assumed everything always works all the time. The truth is oftentimes things break and that's why there's an inventory here. You'll notice this person theoretically, this would never need inventory because they work faster and they'll always just take the part as soon as it's done. But let's say something breaks down here this person, this is the bottleneck, we want to keep them working. So they'll put things into the inventory and then once they're done, they can catch up. So that's downtime. Uh, and that stems from variability. Now I've talked about that being downtime as in like a breakage, but sometimes it's just, you know, this 20 minutes is an average. Sometimes they work 22, sometimes they work 19, sometimes this person takes more. And the buffer allows uh, that, the, uh, which is another term for sort of uh, a queue, a buffer. Um, Americans tend to say buffer, uh, internationally people say queue. But that, so these are the advantages of having those buffers. We can increase utilization, productivity, decrease downtime, uh, which will of course er, uh, adapt for downtime and variability, which will again improve many of our measurements like utilization and productivity. But there are some disadvantages. One of them is it increases our start to finish time. Because if I have products in here, now it's not just going, the product doesn't just have to go 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. They might have to go 10 minutes here, wait for a certain period of time, uh, and then because this person was working ahead and then they go here, this operation, then wait here. Um, maybe there was a, a breakdown over here, so it's waiting here and then it goes there. 
So the start to finish time could actually end up being 10 plus 30 plus 20 plus however much time it spends in the queue. And the more inventory, the more work in process we put in that queue, the longer it's going to wait because most products work on a first in, first out. So if there's three things already here, you've got to wait an hour and a half for all three of those to go through the bottleneck station. And the other problem is that that can create an issue like spoilage or scrap. So um, the spoilage issue is what if these things go bad? What if this is fruit and it's going through some sort of process? Some of them might go bad in the period in the queue. Now this is, you know, we're measuring in minutes, so that might not be a critical issue in this process, but other ones it might. And also scrap, because what you'll find is, let's say uh, there's a problem with uh, one of these parts and we don't know until it gets to the last station, the person says, hey, this part, it, 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 it came from, you know, it was bad when we put it into the system and they could do their jobs, but I can't do mine. This can't make a finished product. Well, now we don't just have the one part, we have to throw it out. We don't just have the one part from all the three stations. We have each station's part plus however many were in the queue. More inventory, the more we have to scrap. So that's the disadvantage of inventory. It's also important to note that because of this variability, we often, uh, if, if, uh, this person pull, let's, let's say there's a break, uh, how should I say this? Um, oftentimes because of breakdowns further down the line, you want to have, to keep the banks, to keep these queues filled, if there is a, uh, uh, let's say this person is pulling from this operation uh, or, or here, um, and there's a breakdown, the, 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 this person could drain the queue and then you don't have it if you need it again. So you have to refill it. And if they're all running at the same speed, you have to, uh, uh, especially if you have a balanced line, you have the, um, the queue will never get filled because they're running at a steady rate. So what you actually want to do is you might have to work overtime to fill the queues back up. Or what's more common is people will overspeed the line a little further up. So you actually want your earlier stations running a little faster so that if there's a breakdown and a queue gets drained, you can fill it up over time after the repair. So those are some issues on inventory. Now I want to talk about different setups. I've sort of treated this as an assembly line and that is one kind of, I call that line here, that's one kind of operation. But it's also common if you're doing smaller products, production runs and more variable production runs, you can have a batch process which is where you have maybe, uh, you know, if you're manufacturing, your drill press is over here, and then your milling machine is over here, and then your painting station is over there, and all your drill presses are here, and all your mills, and all your painting stations, and you, the, the operator takes them to whichever processes are needed. And that's more typical of like a small machine shop, because they're not, uh, it doesn't make sense to do a line, because they're not always making the same product. They're doing a lot of di some different products need different processes. And then there's a hybrid between those two, which is called, and we talk a little bit about what the uh, uh, reasons for choosing one or the other was. And then the cell manufacturing is a little bit more, uh, uh, sort of a hybrid between those two. It's where you, you have maybe a small workstation, a work cell they call it, where you have one drill press, one milling machine, and one paint. And then for another product, you have a drill press and a milling machine and a lathe and a, a, a paint station or powder coating. And because they're, uh, the products are different, we want to we want to keep different cells. We don't want to have one assembly line, but we, w but we know that certain products go through a certain series. So rather than put all the drill presses in one area, we'll put one on each type of product we make. And that's where you sort of have a, uh, a hybrid between batch and line. And the last one is like continuous flow. A lot of chemicals, they're not really assembly lines, uh, but they are manufactured in, on a continuous basis where there's no really stop, put it in the queue, move it to the next station. It's just continuously flowing. Last thing I want to talk about, and here I'll get a little bit into service, is you can have series production or parallel production. So like an assembly line is series, everything goes through a certain station. Parallel is where we have mixed different stations and each one goes start to finish in each. And a good example of this in the service industry is McDonald's versus Wendy's. If you go to a, uh, a Wendy's on a, during lunch hour, they have one line. Uh, and, and, the one and the one line goes to one of maybe one or two registers and each person stays in the same line. Whereas McDonald's has several different lines. They work them in parallel. And it's interesting to note, typically in the fast food industry, the series, the Wendy's is actually a little bit faster, but because McDonald's has so many more, um, there's actually kind of a consumer marketing issue because McDonald's has 
a, a much larger uh, volume of customers, people walk in and they say a 50 person line and they freak out and they wouldn't wait in it. But if you go in and you see uh, five lines of 10, it seems more digestible, even though in reality it's probably a little bit slower and it's certainly more unfair because some lines get caught up on one person or the other. So those are some different kinds of f flows that you can set up your operations as. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the practical uh, problems that you run into here. Those are, uh, let me make sure I got everything I wanted to say there. Yes. So the, some of the practical considerations are, look, when you have inventory, you know, we've said we want inventory to allow us some flexibility to keep working if we have a breakdown somewhere in their system. The problem is it might actually get us to be a bit more lackadaisical. It's, it's like a band-aid. Inventory covers up the variability and the breakdown, so we might not be as diligent maintaining things. And so as a result, inventory can decrease our diligence. Um, rather than sort of drilling down and fixing the problem, we just cover it up by adding inventory. Um, same thing can happen with backup, and this can be like a backup machine, a redundant machine. Let's buy two machines so in case one breaks, the other one, we, we can use the other one. But what can happen there is we don't, it doesn't matter as much how well we maintain the first machine, uh, but we've doubled our cost. So backups can decrease diligence. You could also say adding operators decreases diligence. Like if you just throw manpower, whenever you have a problem, you get behind, you just put more people on it. And these practical problems are what really led us to um, what, what's called lean manufacturing. So lean manufacturing, I'm going to use a bunch of Japanese words here because it was uh, notably pioneered by the Japanese, although for the record they did borrow some of their ideas from Americans, but the Americans, uh, the experts just couldn't get American industry to follow them. So they went to Japan and gave some, some tips to the Japanese, and now it's become uh, sort of uh, associated with Japan and some of Japanese words, and if you want to sound really slick you can use the Japanese terms. This is particularly, um, uh, Toyota is particularly known as one of the uh, innovators in this area and, and they've also been very open about sharing the Toyota production system so they kind of get a lot of credit for this. But the first one is Kaizen which stands for continuous improvement and if you want to think about it some of this inventory and backup that you could almost argue that's continuous uh, decay because what happens is every time you have a problem you'll add inventory or you'll add backups rather than fix the problem. They take the opposite approach under lean manufacturing they say look what we want to do is we actually want to take inventory out until we start to stop our production line. And that will show us where the variability is coming from our process. And then rather than put add inventory to solve or to work around it, we will fix the variability. We will improve the process for it. And they use the analogy of it's like uh, rocks in a river. This is like water and these are some rocks. You want to lower your inventory level, stress your system until you see a rock. And then you pick the rock out and throw it out. And then you lower it a little more until you see the next lowest rock. And you pick that one and throw it out and then lower it a little bit more. Now the advantage of this is that you're always improving your process. The downside is it's hard. I mean you've got uh, uh, you're having to sort of remove inventory and shock the system to get there. Another concept I want to talk about is uh, Jidoka, um, or oftentimes called the Andon, named after the Andon Cordupole. What this says is, you know, historically, sometimes if you have a problem in uh, one of these areas, you would, you would just keep pushing it through the system and then fix all of them at the end. And oftentimes an assembly line will have a repair repairman or repair woman at the end to solve for that. And what they found essentially is the, that can create a problem because the person who, cre who finds the problem or maybe even creates the problem does, isn't responsible for fixing it. So Jidoka means we stop the line essentially when we have a problem. Usually there's an, uh, a cord called an andon cord. You pull it once to let the supervisor or the team leader know you have a problem. That brings them over to your station to help. And if that doesn't work, you can hit it a second time to stop the line before it leaves your station. And the idea is you are now accountable for your own quality problems. Now the disadvantage of that, however, is if this person stops the line, it means, and, and you know, if, we, if it's in a constant assembly line, we don't really have inventory between stations, it stops everybody. So there's more downtime involved in it. But the theory is, fixing the problem is more uh, valuable than uh, offsets the cost of the downtime. Um, the next concept I want to talk about is Heijunka. This means, uh, it's basically about the, oh I should also say on Jidoka, it's important to note that um, 
this does empower your employees and that can be a good thing because now they're empowered to solve the problem but it also some firms are a little bit uncomfortable giving their unskilled especially operators the power to stop the production process so it takes a, a bit of a leap of faith there also under hey Junka, this is uh, essentially picking the mix of products so let's say you have three products and there's some setup time we'll get to that in a moment you got to change your process a little bit each time you have one well, the, some people would say, well, because of setup time, we should do one product on Monday, another product on Tuesday, third product on Wednesday, and then Thursday we'll go back to the first product. Well, the, and, the, and the idea is you're minimizing your setup times there, but and you can be a little bit more efficient. The, pro, the Japanese, the lean manufacturing technique says, though, no, you want to have a mix of one, one third of them each and every day, maybe even one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three as they come down the line. And the reason for that is, uh, several fold. First of all, if you're training people, you, uh, you know, you, it's, uh, you will have, um, it would take you three days to train them the other way and by the fourth day they might have forgotten how to do the first one. Here they learn it and they continue to do it the same way every day. It also levels out your suppliers because if you didn't do this, the suppliers, the person who is supplying uh, parts for your first product would have to, uh, you know, be either be still for two days a week or they would have to produce into inventory more slowly, in which case you're increasing inventory and that's uh, got some I issues associated, you know, spillage, pardon me, spoilage and scrap. Um, and also, uh, um, so, it, it, or, or they would, um, well, it'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. It allows your supply chain to go at a constant rate. And the last thing I want to talk about under the Japanese, there's a couple more that I put in the live presentation, but I, I just hit the majors here for the sample, is uh, they use supermarkets or a Kanban system. Historically speaking, on the assembly line, they used to just put all the parts you would need. They would store the inventory of the parts, the work in process, next to the station. You would grab them as you need them. That can create inefficiencies in several ways. First of all, it, it takes up a lot of space, so it's not necessarily space efficient. Also, the operator now has to walk larger distances because there's big bins of parts that they have to pull from. And this says you actually, um, the, the, the Kanban system means that you keep your uh, parts in a supermarket somewhere. It's like one place in the plant has all of the parts and then the workstation is smaller and more compact. And when you need one, you just drop a card in a slot, for example, is how we used to do it. And the, there's a person who goes by and gets the, gets the tags for what needs to be picked and brings it to you. And there's several advantages to that. Um, one of them is the um, you have a central place, you've got smaller assembly line and you a smaller space on the assembly line, and you also have a centralized place where all of the uh, uh, you can you can check where your inventory is light and heavy all in one place at the supermarket. You don't have to go around the whole assembly line to find out what you have parts for and what you don't. Now I do like to point out on this lean manufacturing, it's very popular in the 90s, but it also happened, it also, it's also one-sided. As I pointed out, most of these will have a, a corresponding disadvantage. The, you know, Kaizen requires you to lower inventory so you're less able to withstand shocks, or uh, and on cord pulling means the, the, you're, you've got, you stop the line and everybody has to stop and wait for things to be fixed. So there's disadvantages. Just generally speaking, uh, this is found to work for ma mass products, mass manufacturing, but I don't want you to get too faddish. Remember, there are trade-offs, and I think this happened at a particular time in America where we'd gotten a little fat and lazy with our manufacturing. We were full of inventories and backups and redundancies, and as a result, everything that was Japanese was sort of thought to uh, automatically be better, and that's not necessarily the case, although it often is. Now let's just cover a few last topics here. We talked a lot about setup. Sometimes when you change uh, the product you're making or the, the model you're making, you have to do a setup. There used to be something uh, in, in, in really old fashioned factories that they would call expediters. If there was an order, you know, we talked about how more inventory slows your start to finish time. And if there was an important project, you'd have somebody go through and do this and uh, uh, sort of carry it through each station and tell you tell them don't don't do the next product until you're done with mine this is a special order that was a an attempt to minimize the start to finish time the problem is it made the whole thing less efficient because every time there's one of those this person has to stop in the middle of what they're doing and if there's setup time change over to do the new product and then when they're done change back so it increases the set setup time so that'll work that'll decrease the start to finish time for that one product that's being expedited but it will 
slow the process down for everything else in the system because they have to wait for more setups. The total system is worse off. And that kind of works not only just for manufacturing or processes, that's kind of business in general. You know, when the boss says, this is the new hot thing, everybody drops whatever they're doing and does that. And it's important as a manager to remember that the unintended consequences as in, in total work, the total work, the total capacity slows down for that because you're, you're having to have people drop things and switch gears. Um, also, decreasing start to finish time. If you want to decrease your start to finish time, a lot of people think, well, why don't you speed up the bottleneck? Technically, that'll work, but it's important to remember you can also do it by removing inventory. And that's usually what managers do. The knee jerk reaction is, oh, we need faster start, to, we need lower start to finish time, speed up the line. And in reality, you can do it just as easily by minimizing your uh, inventory because that way things will move through quickly because they're not having to wait in inventory. Uh, another point I want to talk about is, you know, we've talked a lot about process here, but that's not the same as profit. So for example, in manufacturing, people might want to decrease the variety of products they make because it makes it more efficient. It's easier, you don't have as many setups, and you don't have uh, a variant, as much variability, so it's best. But remember, sometimes it's important to have a greater variety because the customer demands it. If customers like customized products. So remember, even though it's easy to sort of, you don't, you don't want to manage just for the most efficient process. You have to balance the, 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 pr the process efficiency and the process cost with the potential profit lost um, for uh, doing things that might be uh, against the process. And then the last things I want to talk about, I didn't have a lot of time in my sample to get to quality, but I have a lot of uh, ideas on that. And the one I always say, oh, uh, one more thing, on the, on the profit versus process, a good example of that is, you know, Ford, when they invented the Model T and basically developed the modern car market, they painted them all black. They called it any color as long as, you're, as, long as it's black, because black was the cheapest paint and they could, um, and, and they didn't have to change any of their machinery. They didn't have to purge any of their painting equipment. It was always black, to, uh, so they didn't have to purge for color change. But then General Motors came along and made multiple colored vehicles, and General Motors surpassed Ford and has, done, has, has outsold them basically ever since. And so that's an important point where even though it was harder from a process perspective to have multiple colors, it was ultimately more profitable. Um, moving back on to quality. Uh, one, the, I ju I'll just hit one thing here for the sample. We can talk about statistical quality control, a little bit about quality control, quality teams, quality circles. But the main point is uh, I like to make is, you know, a lot of people would say, well, you know, quality, and I'll by, by process quality, I mean minimizing the variability. I mean, every, pe every piece meets spec, uh, meets the specification consistently. This doesn't necessarily mean quality as in like, oh, I like leather as opposed to cloth. Um, that's not necessarily a product, uh, a process issue. But uh, you want to make sure that you're minimizing your variability. And one theory was, well, if you want to have more quality, you've got to spend more money to have fancier equipment. And what they've actually said is, look, a lot of the costs of quality are things like rework and inspection and, you know, fixing things. And what they found is that as they've improved the quality, their cost actually didn't go up, it went down because the, uh, they were eliminating that expensive rework and that expensive inspection and returning products uh, and scrapping things. So th that became, uh, there's a uh, big movement called the quality is free movement. And I put a question mark on there because in the examples I gave you that's true, but there are some elements where it will take a more expensive machine to tighten your tolerances. So it's not always free, but it can be. And the last one I want to talk about, last but certainly not least, are the human factors. Things like uh, productivity. Uh, one of the first uh, 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 the stories told when you first study industrial engineering is they talk about uh, Taylor and how uh, Frederick Taylor and how he would uh, he he measured how much how big the uh, the the shovelers shovels were and he said if you make them too big people get worn out because they can't lift that much but if you make them too small people can keep shoveling but they they they're not shoveling very much and so he found the right size of shovel and so that's how some of the human factors can improve your productivity. Um, also ergonomics and safety. Ergonomics, these are related. Ergonomics is like fitting the uh, process to the person so you uh, avoid things like um, uh, repetitive stress injuries, especially like carpal tunnel you might have heard of. You, you, you want to, and, and so whereas from a process perspective you might want the same person doing the same thing every day, but from an ergonomic perspective you might want to rotate them so they don't wear out any one 
part of their body doing the same thing all every day. And uh, safety, um, a, a similar thing, just a, a more catastrophic rather than over time. And the important thing to remember with these two is, first of all, the good news, you, you want to do it for, for the point of human dignity, hopefully. You want to have good working conditions. But the good news is, compared to the price of, of labor and certainly injury, people are actually very expensive. So the equipment to solve most of these ergonomic and safety problems are actually not that expensive. And you want to make sure that you're thinking of it in terms of big picture, because it's easy to sort of look at thousands of dollars worth of safety equipment and go, wow, that's a lot of money, we don't want to spend it. But in reality, the cost of an injury would more than offset that, not to mention the fact that thousands of dollars might not be that much compared to the cost of your labor force. So that's kind of a good news because the price there, I mean, even in developing countries now, uh, wages are rising and it means uh, safety equipment um, is uh, worth the uh, investment. And I, I talk a little bit more about some tricks of safety equipment, fall protection, things like that in the live presentation. Um, and the last one I want to talk about is the environment. You have to worry about uh, both the toxic effects. Are you putting anything in the water or the air that's dangerous? Um, also, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency. And then finally, you can solve some of these, uh, you can solve some of your consumption through things like returnable containers. Uh, so for example, instead of getting every, all of your parts from a supplier in a cardboard box, they come in on a pallet that's specific for them and you fold it up and send it back to that supplier. And if there's one message I want to give to you that I think is really important for all of these things, you know, I talked about it in quality, but it also meets productivity, safety, and then the environment, returnable containers, things like that. It's easy to sort of say, well, safety must cost us money, or quality must cost us money, or returnable containers might cost us money, but because they cost more than cardboard. But in reality, most of these things aren't cause and effect with each other. What happens is when they improve as you have a better process. And so one of the things that was interesting in our, uh, my plant is when we made a big safety push, quality improved. And the reason for that is they're both driven by the same thing. The way you improve safety is you have people follow the proper procedures, and when they follow the proper procedures, you also get quality improving. And the same thing with the environment. When you are, uh, you know, returnable containers might cost more to buy, but you only have to pay for them once, and then all of a sudden your supplier can tell how much you need by how many containers are coming back and they have a check against your orders. So a lot of these things are not, don't, don't, don't easily fall into the trap of thinking that uh, cost and process are in conflict with quality, safety, and the environment. They're oftentimes not. So anyway, that's, uh, that's quite a bit on operations, but I can do more uh, in a live presentation. If you'd like to see something like this presented at your organization or event, please contact me for a proposal at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.